Good afternoon. Do we have our long list of attendees uh, connected? Hello. Yeah, I think we're great to go. All right, excellent. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Hutchinson. I'm the National Sales Director for Sapiens. We'd uh, first like to welcome you to today's presentation of staying ahead of loan servicing obstacles. Uh, we have a good turnout for today's discussion, and, and we first want to sincerely thank you for the time that you're giving us to learn more about, uh, about what we do. Uh, you know, we, we recently uh, spent some time at the servicing conference in Orlando several weeks ago discussing the many challenges that services are facing now, and we discovered a, a number of critical needs that Decision solves and look forward to sharing uh, our story with you. Before we get too much further into the presentation, uh, I'm sure you guys are probably familiar with the webinar. If you have any questions, uh, which we are looking forward to, responding to, please log those into the chat box and we'll have a Q&A session after the presentation. Uh, before we start with the presentation, I'd like to give you a quick download on Sapiens just very briefly and then we'll dive right into the presentation. Uh, in, in the way of credibility, I think Sapiens is a company that you would feel good about working with. We're a le leading global provider of software solutions across the financial space. Uh, we have actually approaching 190 customers globally, <clears throat> including the two largest originators in the United States. Several large investment banks are also using our product and methodology called Decision. Uh, we are a publicly traded company on NASDAQ. Uh, our, our symbol is uh, TASE, and we have global offices across uh, North America, the UK, Europe, Asia, and the Pacific. Uh, have exceeded 1,200 employees at Sapiens International. Very strong revenue picture and cash position. Uh, so once again, from a credibility and performance standpoint, we're somebody that we hope that you would feel good about if we pique your interest in, uh, in today's uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to go through our agenda two parts. Uh, first, we will cover living models, turning regulations and policy into a managed and executable asset, and second part, the business value of decision management. So I'd, I'd like to proudly introduce our presenter for today. Janet Eakes is our business owner, financial services uh, for Sapiens Decision. Uh, she has over 30 years of management and operational experience in the space. Prior to coming on board with us, Janet served as COO of the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board and an SBP for mortgage operations at Freddie, where she uh, was on board with them for over 20 years. So Janet, thank you very much, and uh, you can take it uh, take it from here. Thank you, Hutch, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I want to start with an introduction of the business problem that Sapiens Decision solves. First, in IT, we recognize that there are many advanced technologies utilized in mortgage servicing organizations and by mortgage servicing vendors, advanced technologies including commercial rules technologies that are quite sophisticated and save time, reduce risk, and reduce the cost of servicing a loan. Those technologies, however, have only exacerbated the problem that the business does not have comparable tools and methods to discover, define, and validate business logic for which IT establishes business rules in an automated system. Business logic is found in business policies and the growing number of regu regulations that servicers must implement and in the operational decisions that must be automated by IT and business systems. That logic is often conveyed to IT in very ambiguous narratives and imprecise rules, tables, or catalogs. Once implemented, the accuracy is questionable 
and it is very difficult for servicers on the business side to understand how the business logic is executed in code. And if you're using a, a servicing vendor, also that is even harder to trace and have a constructive conversation. That's the gap we fill. We provide the methodology, the decision model, it's a structure that is testable and verifiable of business logic by the business and operations prior to being consumed by IT so that what is handed off is not ambiguous, it is simplified, and it is far more efficient. It is the means by which servicers can, uh, on the operations side, can assure operational compliance, whether it's uh, implemented by the servicer's IT or by a vendor. So let's start with the decision model and why it's so effective. Before the decision model, what we find in organizations that we work with are rules catalogs that are very lengthy, often tens of thousands of rows, that are very confusing and ambiguous. Statements are long and statements are short. They're mapped to business context, in this case a rules group, and yet when we look at the logic across groups, it's inconsistent, there are gaps, but it's very hard to look across thousands of rows of these uh, narrative statements and pinpoint the problems. And if you were to scoop up all of the business rules and try and understand the organization, it would be impossible. This is the method for deriving business rules that servicers and servicer vendors typically live with. So the, the problem is there's no standards here. There's no standards for business logic from which automated rules are derived. It would be much like trying to buy a boat or <laughs> Uh, go on a boating excursion without being able to trust the fact that all boat manufacturers build to principles and standards. You know the boat, no matter how complex it looks, is going to float. Well, likewise, we want to know that the business logic, once established by the business, is accurate and will execute without all of the compliance problems we're dogged with. We want to turn regulations into logic quickly and we want that to be executable. That's where the decision model principles bring value. The principles are about structure to ensure that the logic statements are in their simplest form and that they're directly executable, that they're technology independent. We don't have to tie ourselves to any one technology or technology vendor, and there's integrity to the logic, that they are consistent, all the logic that is modeled and handed off to IT is consistent without gap. We've tested it, and we know it is before we hand it to IT. So an example, I'm going to start with the simplest and then build a little bit in complexity, but you will see as I build in complexity that it still stays very simple for the business to understand and IT to execute. Business logic is the means by which business drives conclusions from conditions. The simplest, if only this, this simple of a case existed in reality, but the simplest one would be one conditioning condition leading to a conclusion. In this hypothetical case, a person's credit rating is less than 650, therefore this hypothetical business is going to conclude that the person's likelihood of defaulting on a loan is high. But typically there is more than one condition leading to such a conclusion. So the principles of the decision model ensure that we can produce this two-dimensional standard rule family. This is the basis of all decision models. And this rule family is in business terms, very easy to understand. I'm going to go through how you read through this rule family to drive out ambiguity. We now have two more conditions we're considering before concluding the likelihood of defaulting on a loan. We are now going to consider a person's credit score, 
a person's employment history and a person's other loans amount before we determine likelihood of default. Each row is a complete and independent statement of logic that can be converted, transformed into code automatically. You read across a row by ending conditions. So let's read across the first row. If a person's credit score is less than 650 and a person's employment history is unstable, and a person other loan amount is high, then a person's likelihood of defaulting on a loan is high. Independent statement of logic. Now I'm going to or as I go down the rows. Or if a person's credit score is less than 720 and a an person's employment history is unstable and a person's other loans amount is low, likelihood of defaulting on a loan is, in this case, medium. Or, and I go down to the third row, if a person's credit score is greater than or equal to 720 and a person's employment history is unstable, I don't have to worry about their other loan amounts. That's all I need to conclude the risk is medium. And finally, the final row determines a low likelihood of defaulting on a loan. This now is a complete logic table for one conclusion and only one conclusion, likelihood of default on a loan. We never mix multiple conclusions in one table. That's how we ensure simplicity and drive out ambiguity. I can create graphical models, and, and actually these are the only two assets created in the decision model. You have the graphical model of the full decision and you have world family tables that make up the graphical model. The octagon at the top is the ultimate business decision, in this case, determine person's likelihood of default. The blue tablet, or some call it a tombstone, the first one under the octagon is the conclusion world family. Person's likelihood of default is at the top above the solid line. Below it are the three conditions that we just reviewed in the rural family table. Those conditions are under the solid line. Those conditions, actually the value of 650 and 720 for credit score has to be derived from other logic. The person's unemployment history of unstable has to be derived from additional logic and other loans amount has to be derived. So because those values for those conditions are the result of other logic, we create um, uh, logic tables for each of those conditions now, but we make that condition the conclusion of the supporting rule family and we'll drive out the logic that is required to derive those values. Here is a complete decision model with all of the supporting rural families and their conditions depicted or represented. In this case, it's determining a policy renewal method. That's the octagon at the top. We can quickly ascertain from looking at the conclusion rural family at the top that policy renewal method is based on three conditions, policy pricing within bounds, policy underwriting risk, and policy manual underwriting indicator. Now notice there is a dotted line. Below the dotted line are conditions for which additional logic is not necessary. We can get the values of underwriting indicator directly from persisted data, a data source. No further logic is needed, but policy pricing within bounds policy underwriting risk are above that dotted line, therefore those conditions require further logic. And you can see the two supporting rule family tables created for each of those conditions, where those conditions are now a conclusion, and the conditions to derive those interim conclusions are listed. Again, Below the dotted line, you will not find a supporting rule family for those conditions because we just go fetch the data from a database or a persistent data source. 
But the three conditions, insured major location change, insured major ownership change, and policy discount require further logic. Therefore, we know we're going to find three supporting rule family tables to drive out the logic for those conditions which in their own table are conclusions. When we get to that bottom row, notice that all of the conditions are below the dotted line. Now we've come to the end of the logic. For determining policy renewal method, we now have all of the logic organized by conclusions, interim conclusions and the ultimate conclusion, and we see all of the data that's required to make that decision. It's all of the conditions under the dotted line. Often when we write out narrative logic statements, this sort of organization and clarity is impossible. Here we go. This is just showing you how the rule family tables are represented for each of the conditions requiring further logic. Policy pricing within bounds is a condition in the top rule family table. It's underlined in the table. It's above the dotted line, so it requires its own rule family table. Here it is as a conclusion now. The policy discount and policy pricing tier conditions are worked out through separate rows of logic, and we have all of the logic here to determine policy pricings within bounds. Likewise, we see policy discount is underlined or above the dotted line. It's going to require more logic, but policy pricing tier, those values of 1, 1.5, etc., are, are, are obtained from a persisted data source. But for policy discount, we're going to create that supporting rule family table where it is now the conclusion, and we establish the conditions of location, state, category, package discount package grade and policy grade and establish all the rows of logic necessary to determine policy discount. No further logic is necessary. We've come to the end of this tree of logic. Now all of these rule family tables for this tree of logic, if you see, they're simple to understand. Each rule family table is actually reusable in other decisions if, if that um, condition is required to be evaluated in other decisions. And each row of logic can quite easily be transformed into business rules code for any technology. This is going to, I'm going to go through the impact this has on process. So in a business process flow, we often find business logic being integrated with activities. In the top option, in um, determining a person's credit rating of A or other, we're going to consider two conditions here, ascertain person's employment history and ascertain person's debt. You notice in option one and option two, the only difference is that those first two steps in the process, which are the conditions, are reversed. In a process flow, when activity steps do not have sequence dependence, if you can actually change the sequence and it not matter, you know that you are actually flowing logic and not activities, a uh, sequence. Process flows should have sequence dependencies. So if we were to take the logic out of this flow and establish a decision model instead, we would end up with a process flow of only one step, determine person's credit rating. That's the activity that must occur at this point in the process. The octagon indicates we're going to call out to the logic in the logic table. We're going to create a decision model and we're going to put those conditions that, want, that were previously in the flow in this table. We're going to maintain the logic in the table. That means that that process step of determining person's credit rating isn't going to change over time. The logic will, and updating the logic is much 
faster, simpler, and cheaper. So let's consider if instead of two conditions to determine a credit rating, we actually had to consider which is more likely five conditions. Let's go back to the process flow. Five conditions. How many nodes would there be in this flow if we were to include all of that logic in the flow? It's five times five times five, 125 nodes. That's how complicated these flows get. Yet, if we just added three more conditions to our rule family table, we'd only be adding a few more rows. It would still be a complete and simple, straightforward, unambiguous, uh, understandable, traceable, and testable body of logic. In this slide, the process on the left is a very, as you can tell, complex process that we often find in organizations because the logic is embedded in that flow. When we take the logic out, we have a flow on the right. And everywhere you see an octagon, flow is a call out to a logic table. And we maintain that traceability, just like we maintain traceability to regulations. So how, how does this create business value? Well, it creates business value because it accelerates change and it drives out errors. This is a typical process. This is, this is a waterfall process. Um, more and more technology organ and, and servicing organizations are using agile approaches, but still, even within each agile sprint, there is the discover and analyze, author, review, validate, iterate, iterations from subject matter expert to those ambiguous narratives to trying to understand and determine if we've got all the logic or any conflicts, any gaps, review, 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 implement through uh, manual coding, coming out into UAT and discovering far too many problems very late in the process. This is what happens when you use the decision model. You establish decision logic instead of the ambiguous narratives. That logic is fast, very, very fast to create. Know that it's complete. Validate that there are no, and, and Sapiens Technology automatically applies the principles and determines conflicts and gaps and flags them for the modeler. And then you can map it to data and test it with automated test cases or imported test cases at the point you write the logic. It's completely verified and tested at this stage, fast, not through multiple iterations, but through one modeling session. Then, as I mentioned, you validate the principles and test it, and then you create transformation to code and go into UAT. You shorten the cycle by months. And what were months now are weeks and even days in the maintenance cycle. And you can be assured it's accurate and can be traced. The results in execution are traced back to the logic. A use case. we. Uh, joined an organization that was in the middle, uh, 12 weeks into a very critical project, implementing new regulations. Um, this was uh, the rules that they were creating in a rules catalog, over 15,000 rows. They were totally confused. They knew they had consistency problems because when they coded it and then tested it, they were having problems. They couldn't su uh, uh, sustain it. And they couldn't reuse it. So once one sprint was over, it or one project was over, it had to be completely recreated for the next. We came in, and in three weeks, three analysts, we converted all that 15,000 rows to 24 decision models and 149 rule family views. That's how fast it is. Tested. Know it was finished. Know it was complete completely sustainable and tested in the modeling phase with over 35,000 test cases. In another example, 
we went into a servicing organization um, that had these complex unmanageable processes that I uh, showed earlier in the default asset management area. Volumes and backlogs were growing. Of course, volumes uh, and defaults were growing at the time, and they were in a um, very critical situation. It was very difficult to trace back and understand uh, why the timelines, the severities, um, and the surprises in, in audits and in um, production were happening. Constantly surprised by the non-compliance errors and high exception rates, couldn't make the scorecards. So we came in, we mapped the existing processes, discovered and defined the business logic, extracted it, put it in decision models, and passed that back into the multiple applications involved. In this case, there were um, vendor applications and property applications that the alignment had to with with the new logic had to happen, but it happened very quickly. Backlogs dropped by 80%, non-compliance penalties by 30%. Uh, they reduced their contingent liability on their financial statement, and the timelines improved by 50%. And this was a result of this one effort to convert their default management logic. Um, rules to logic and then and then recreate the rules that executed. So I'm going to pause here and turn it back over to Hutch to facilitate a Q&A session. Thank you, Janet. We, uh, we do have uh, a few questions that uh, the group has shared and I will uh, pose these back to you, Janet. First question, uh, how and where is decision utilized in the mortgage process? I know you covered that uh, to some degree. If uh, you want to revisit that, perhaps? Certainly. So decision, savings decision is utilized in this industry across the entire mortgage spectrum, across the mortgage life cycle, and across the mortgage um, entire vertical. So involved, it's utilized in pricing and underwriting decisions. The logic generates code for underwriting engines and for pricing engines. It's used in application um, verifications, income verifications, etc. It's used in producing the new consolidated disclosures to borrowers and mapping those timelines. It's used in monitoring the full loan uh, production cycle and closing of loans. It's used in setting up servicing and transfer servicing and collections, um, automated uh, workflow and decisions and default management determining alternatives to foreclosure and determining investor eligibility and sale and securitization logic, literally across the spectrum. Great. Uh, outstanding question here, number two. Uh, can you tell me how decision differs from any other rules engine business interface? Great question. So a business rules interface does not apply the principles of the decision model, and it's only specific to that technology. So it's fairly free form. There may be some limitations to what you can and cannot um, document in that interface, but it's not going to apply all of the principles of the decision model. It will create variable results. It will not be possible to test that you'll have to convert it into the technology and test it on the other end once it is in technology and it's only you're only able to use it in that technology with the decision model being technology agnostic those rows of logic are able to be transformed into Java into a commercial rules engine uh, rule struct uh, business rule structure um, and we have an execution server that will execute the logic directly, so it really provides far more flexibility to the servicing organization. Okay. 
So last question from the group and another good one. Uh, how long to adopt? Uh, I guess they're looking perhaps for our typical engagement cycle. Um, it takes us a matter of days to train uh, business analysts, policy analysts, uh, data analysts, IT analysts, anyone um, that is in the organization that is responsible for the uh, representing the business logic and rules development. We, we train within a matter of days. We support the implementation over uh, multiple sprints in an agile methodology, and we will produce, as I mentioned in one use case, m many decision models covering much business domain very quickly in a matter of months so that the organization is independent up and running with a completely traceable and reusable repository in a matter of months. Um, it's the fastest way to implement regulation and you'll eliminate the um, multiple phased project approach and revisiting the um, logic and code in multiple phase projects because you'll get it all done in one phase. It's fast, lowers risk, and lowers ultimately the cost per loan. Great. And, and, and guys, in, in, in the first part of our engagement, typically what we do with our clients is that we, we would come in uh, and do a, a day of discovery uh, to become familiar with your process and together identify some possible use cases. Uh, we understand that this has far-reaching implications across your operation, so uh, we're much more comfortable and we, we believe our clients are much more comfortable in running a very short, uh, you know, low, low risk, low entry uh, POC typically runs about uh, two to three weeks. Uh, we have some clients that go direct to pilot that might run six to seven weeks. And uh, we're general, generally pretty liberal with our pricing and, and why do we do this? Uh, we have about a 95 plus percent success rate with uh, prospects and clients that, that run POCs that really like what they see and move forward with us. So, that's kind of uh, our story from the first part of, of, of how we would get this rolling, if you like what you see. So, Janet, if uh, you can, I, I guess, go to the next slide. Uh, we do have uh, a link to our website with a lot of information there. I know that uh, many of you will probably want to check on and do a little self-discovery and, and your own research on that. So we do invite you to jump on sapiensdecision.com for, .com for case studies. Uh, some in-depth product information. We have a webinar library and uh, some news on, on our company as well. But uh, we, we once again, we, we thank you. We have a, had a great turnout for this. We appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, new solutions today are, are, are truly hard to find, and I think that we've got something unique uh, that can have a dramatic impact on your operation if given the opportunity. So we appreciate your time, and uh, please contact us if we can help you out.